TG Geeks, episode 372, April 4th, 2022. Mozart meets Meeker. Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com, where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery, sci-fi, comics, film, horror, genre, opera, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Keith Lane, we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely, actually, Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, and I'm Benny Van Fruity. Love, actually. Right. (laughs) Lovely. Love, actually. (laughs) Did you hear what I said? (laughs) What? I'm Benny Van Fruity. Benny Van Fruity, yes. Coming, yes. Ben, I'm Ben Raggington, also coming to you from TG Squared Studios and here in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, let's get on with it. Prepare for hyperdrive. Meanwhile, in the Hall of Episodes, the two gay geeks are discussing this. We have a real treat for you today. We have the stage director for the Arizona Opera production of Cozy Fantuti that is beginning on Friday night, uh, April the 8th. Mm-hmm. And she's also happens to be the general and artistic director for Opera San Antonio. Yes. So we talked with her about her her route to uh, musical theater and to opera and a general director of a company and uh, then talked about her stage direction of Cozy Fantuti. So I'm really excited. Very for interesting. Everybody. It, it was a fascinating interview. I just, I'm over the moon about it. Mm-hmm. We're going to have our birthday shout outs, our featured podcast of the week and some feedback and regular shout outs. We, I don't know that we're going to have much time in the second segment, but uh, then we'll have our weekly recap and our regular shout outs. Notice we have a lot of shout outs, but we do a lot of, we want to give a lot of people a lot of exposure, and that's what we're all about, is helping other people. And let's just get right into this interview. I am so excited that we have the opportunity to talk to Lauren Meeker. She is the general and artistic director of Opera San Antonio and the stage director for Arizona Opera's production of Cozy Fantuti starting on Friday night. Welcome, Lauren. Well, welcome to you as well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Absolutely. I would just, this was so exciting when, you know, we we set this up. I I was very excited because Cozy is probably, it's one of Mozart's best ensemble it is. pieces. It, it, it is, and yet it's one of those operas that seems to fly under a lot of people's radar. They usually go from Marriage of Figaro directly to Don Giovanni and, and then, then to Magic, Magic Flute. Flute. Exactly. And Cozy <laughs> completely flies under the radar, and it shouldn't, because it is an amazing piece of work. Glorious music with some interesting characterizations going on there. Exactly. But uh, we'll instead of going too. into that, why don't yeah. we talk to you? Exactly. Instead of letting us <laughs> chat among ourselves. <laughs> so tell us, you, you've kind of had an interesting, circuitous route to general and artistic director of Opera San Antonio. Uh, so tell us the elevator pitch of your life and how you got into music, musical theater. I saw you did it some dance. Was this at a, a young age you discovered your talent? Or uh, just give us that elevator pitch of your life to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the elevator pitch is I have a lot of family in theater. All behind the scenes. Uh, no one's an actor or a, a dancer by profession, but stage directors, stage managers, managing directors, uh, designers, artists. And so I really grew up 
in an extremely artistic household uh, and extended family. Um, and I suppose the nut didn't fall far from the tree, <laughs> as they say. Yeah. So I was really, really captivated by the arts early on. And so the um, dancing, the gymnastics, the um, acting, all of that was part of who I was growing up from a very young age. Super. Uh, and then, really, I tripped over opera quite by accident. That's where the biggest um, sort of curveball came in my life. Um, I had done undergraduate studies at, at Boston University for straight theater and uh, came home after a year's internship at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Wow. I'd come home to Boston, and I, I didn't really know what my future was going to hold. And a former college roommate was working at uh, both of the opera companies in Boston at the time, and one of them needed help with their stage management team. Interesting. And she reached out to me. She knew I was back in town, and she said, would you be interested? And I, honestly, I think my answer was, will you pay me? And she said, yes. And I said, great. <laughs> and it was so surprising because this was a, a performing arts world that I had had very little exposure to. But the second I set my foot in the door, all of these different disciplines that I had been playing around with uh, from a very young age all the way up through college suddenly applied and I could use them. And it was a wonderful artistic environment for me. And I never looked back. It's been almost all opera ever since that really first opportunity. Far out. So you literally grew up in the wings of, of a theater and saw all of it. I, literally, I did. Wow. Yeah, I mean, most of my early childhood was spent um, traipsing around the backstage area of the Huntington Theater uh, in Boston or in Williamstown. Uh, my parents were working at uh, both of those institutions and, and many, many others. Fun. So, yes, it was um, definitely a theater geek, a theater kid by heart. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I I really enjoyed some of the, the things that they did at the, the gala last week because I was in the orchestra and we did uh, from the three years I was in high school, we did four different all school musicals. We did sound of music, Oklahoma and guys and dolls and uh, my fair lady, my fair lady. So oh, sure. some of the yeah. stuff that they did was incredible. And I wound up being the stage manager for my fair lady, you know, and it was, or uh, uh, student director, well, student director. I was stage manager <laughs> for guys and dolls. That's what it was. <laughs> and, and, so sad. Well, you know what I like about that connection, you know, what Arizona opera did at their gala this uh, past week and, and mixing up some of the kinds of the repertoire that the, uh, audience was being able to hear is helping to draw the the musical through line from operatic roots all the way up to musical theater, Absolutely. all the way up to what you're hearing on, say, even pop radio today. Exactly. Um, you know, they're not these distinct, separate entities with these niche audiences that will only understand them if you happen to be steeped in classical music. You know, oh, yeah. they're really opera and musical theater can be quite expansive really fun and really entertaining. So I'm with you. I love that. I thought it was a fantastic presentation. Yeah. And, and I, I grew up, you know, listening to opera as a child as well. My, my parents, although, you know, they, they never encouraged my musical abilities, uh, but they always listened to classical music and there was all that uh, there. But anyway, so how did you kind of come to be the general uh, director and artistic director of Opera San Antonio. Is there a, so con is there a connection had, there with Arizona Opera? <laughs> there is. I mean, there's, sort of a, there's a life connection. There's a life connection and there's um, uh, a career connection. So something very, very early on, even before I was in opera, I had always played around with the idea of really wanting to chance to be able to run my own company. And then when I came up through the ranks in the opera world and, you know, learned to discover myself as the stage director, as an artist in that right, what that job path lets me do in opera is essentially become an independent uh, contractor roaming the globe from company to company. Um, you know, creating projects that are one-off experiences. 
But within those cumulative years of one-off experiences, I got to see how so many different kinds of opera companies worked. And so I was, um, without really intending to, stockpiling a lot of information about how to work within an opera company, how to work within a community, and how to make that uh, experience successful. Exactly. So then fast forward to 2017, 2018, I was invited uh, to stage direct the Barber of Seville for Opera San Antonio. And then I followed that up the next year with a production of La Boheme. Then I followed that up the next year with a production of Tosca. Wow. So by the time Opera San Antonio was doing a general and artistic director search, I actually already had three experiences with that company. Right. I'd gotten to know the city, the board, some of the patrons, and really the inside workings of the company. And it's a very young company. Right. Um, it was only founded in the 14-15 season. Wow. And so I could tell I that, that this was like a diamond in the rough, right? That there was a lot of uh, great intention, great desire, but maybe all of the puzzle pieces in terms of really putting together a financially sound and artistically sound and well-structured company um, were still in development. And so when the opportunity came up, I leapt at it and it just so happened that uh, my contract started in January of 2020. I moved to San Antonio. I wrapped up a couple of directing projects, moved to San Antonio on March uh, 1st. Oh, my God. Oh, no. 15 oh, no. days later. <laughs> I, I know. You, know. you know where I'm going with this. 12 <laughs> days later, you know, we were calling emergency board meetings to say, wow. you know, the face of our season is changing. I think we're going to need to cancel our spring production and I'm worried about next year. And, you know, here we are two years later. So it's been a really um, unexpected journey. Again, something in terms of management that I had always been interested in or had been for a long time, but what management meant timed with, uh, COVID-19 was the completely unprecedented part. Well, but I, that was, that had to be a tremendous learning experience though. If you can make it through the tough times exactly. and still survive that, <laughs> then you can do you know, anything. Is, yeah. So many people have said, oh my gosh, I can't imagine. And I said, well, you know what? I don't really know general direction under any other circumstances. <laughs> all I know is general direction. You're going to be in crisis mode all the time. <laughs> In crisis mode, we're just going to pull the rug right out from me, whether so, like, go, what are we doing? And I actually was really proud. We've, it's a very small staff, a very small company, but I was so proud of us for the collaborations and the outside the box thinking that we did. We, you know, we produced two films in collaboration with Austin Opera and Houston Grand Opera. We started seven new digital programs. Are some of those were education based and won us awards. We became the first opera company in Texas to return to indoor live theater. I mean, it's really, it's really been an exhausting but very fulfilling journey. And now well, the game's going to change. Now yeah. the game is going to be okay. But you, as the pandemic starts to lift, as we can go back to more live performances, how do we re-engage with the community in a new way and re-spark interest in live performance and entertainment? Exactly. But you also have, you know, that that experience of where can opera go to bring it to more audiences yeah. and to, mo- to bring more people yeah. and put butts in the seat. Yeah, that's say. been one of the big you things know. that um, a lot of the older opera companies have maybe kind of lost that uh, they've lost their vision. And, you know, and that is how do you get new people into the seats? How do you, how do you create this opera outreach program? And it's, it's interesting right. that you were able to turn this in t- terrible negative that COVID-19 uh, delivered and, you know, right, right as you're starting, you know, to uh, completely flip that into a positive. I mean, that yeah. really, that, yeah. that is a good feather in your cap and it's going to look great on your resume. Exactly. As, as did, <laughs> as did Arizona <laughs> opera. You. I mean, you know, Arizona did, uh, they just pivoted and it's like, wow, you yeah. know, <laughs> it's amazing. The interesting yeah, story. In- Go ahead. Yeah, and they pivoted in a couple of different directions, right? You know, exactly. they, like the Copper Queen right. the film work that they're doing, yeah, yeah, or the the comic uh, ver- comic book, I should say, version of 
Carmen, mm-hmm. right. or even getting back to uh, Cozy Fantute and the production that we're working on, which is, of course, a return to live theater and return to grand opera, but um, not in the way you necessarily would have expected. You know, right. Joe and the rest of the group at, at Arizona uh, really was very forward thinking when they approached me and said, you know, how do we make this piece viable to tell in 2022? Exactly. Is this a story that we can continue to present and why should we be presenting it? Right. And so to have a a company that is focused on pushing the art form forward, allowing it to be a living, breathing piece, even though some of these pieces that we were working on are over 200 years old, exactly. that they still can be treated in a new way, with a new light, make them more accessible, with them resonate in 2022. That's a, a fantastic vision for this company, and it makes it really exciting to be here as an artist as well. Exactly. So tell us about... Um I was going to tell a story, but about the 1st of March of 2020, we were in New York City. We were ready to see four Metropolitan Opera productions. And the minute we we landed on Monday, I had an email that said, your backstage tour has been canceled. And then comes Mm -hmm. the Thursday email, we've canceled the season. And that was supposed to be our first opera. And it's like... Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we left Sunday yeah. night, and they closed the city on Monday. Yeah, so. we got out just in time. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so wow. since since you brought up Cozy Van Tute, uh, I'm very interested. I mean, we talked a little bit about this with you last weekend, but I, I'd really like to go into a, a bit more in, uh, in depth detail as to this this approach. Uh, I mean, for, do you want to first explain, you know, to to our listeners what Cozy Van Tute is all about? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Cozy gets a bad rap. You know, the very, very beginning of this uh, conversation, we talked about how it often gets skipped over. Um, but uh, it has some of, I think, Mozart's most gorgeous oh music. My Lord. And I do think it has a viable storyline. It's just a really tricky one. And the reason it's tricky is because, you know, the English translation of Cozy Fun Today is women are like that. Right. And it's sung by three male characters very late. It's a line from the opera that's sung by three male characters very late in the piece with a very negative attitude towards women. Okay, so why does that happen? It happens because one of the characters, Don Alfonso, who's older than these two young male lovers, essentially at the beginning of the opera, he sends these two guys on um, an absurd bet to yes. get them to prove that their women will not be faithful. Yeah, and they come back the with the Groucho opera, Mark glasses, and, and they're not right, recognized. And, and this guy is, yeah, it's, it's absurd. I mean, it's a comedy, right? So there's, yeah. there's absurdity thrown into the mix, and there's disguises, and uh, the lovers end up falling in love with each other's partners. I mean, it's really this fantastic rigmarole, but when the line is sung... Um, the men are feeling duped and jaded and um, and really everything has gone awry with their lives. And so for a lot, a lot of the history of Cozy, there's even I have directed it with this in mind in, in past productions over the years. Um, there's a, a sense that, yes, the outcome of this story is that women are unfaithful and the men sort of forgive them. And so there's kind of this black mark on a happily ever after kind of ha ha ha. That was a comedy. Right. Okay. 2022. (laughs) That's the hard story to tell. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a hard story to tell because no one wants to think that women or anybody else are just, um, you know, silly and and unfaithful and romping around without consequence. Nobody wants to, um, you know, sort of look at this wild madcap adventure through disguises and all of that and think, okay, well, you know, how do we come out the other side of that? Right. And, and, and if you, so if you I, go, if you look into the subtext too, it does not exactly paint men in a really positive image either. I mean, you look at the rack. psychology, you know, and men are, if men you are really pigs. analyze it, <laughs> men are, men are pigs. I mean, so it's not a flattering opera all around. You are correct. So, interestingly enough, when I sat down to really study the piece, the first thing that I wanted to do is take the wool off my own eyes and go, okay, there's history with this piece, there's tradition with this piece. 
what of that history and tradition is useful for me as a director and what can I reimagine? How can I study the, the text and the music from a fresh perspective and maybe make different choices? And part of the answer came in the subtitle of the piece, which is The School for Lovers. Oh. It's not just The School for Women. It's The School for Lovers, which says to me there's something for every character in this piece to learn about themselves. Yeah. It is not just a story that's out to trick the women. There is something in here that we all need to learn. Okay, so then I took another step and started calling a lot of uh, singers who I know that have familiarity with the piece, uh, lots of different designers who I have worked with. And what interestingly came to pass was that um, the common theme again and again and again was, okay, Don Alfonso might set the lovers up on this bet, on this traipse through disguise and swapping lovers. But, if at any point in that opera is there not the possibility of the women having agency and making their own choices, exactly. why do they just have to and, and playing into it? Exactly. <laughs> Correct. Okay, so that level unlocked on a couple of things, and so then when I when I coalesced uh, all these ideas, coalesced, pardon me, all these ideas, and brought together an all female design team, which was. Uh, by choice, but by accident at the same time. Right. It just happened that women are like that. The women designers I was talking to were thinking outside the box. And so we put this brilliant design team together that said, well, why does women are like that have to be a, a negative connotation? Why can't women are like that be a positive or taking control of their circumstances and, and moving forward be part of the vision of this piece? So we made a, a choice very early on to set the piece at the beginning of the opera in the Rococo time period from both an architectural standpoint and from a, a fashion standpoint. And the reason we did that was because, you know, that, that sort of a beautiful, gorgeous, full silhouette costumes like think Marie Antoinette, you know, they're lush, they're right. effervescent, they're, um, you know, colorful. And that would have been a time period that was leading right up into when Mozart was uh, composing Cozy in 1790. Right. Now, if you also look what was happening in that era, um, generally speaking, marriages were prearranged. So it's likely that the couples that we meet at the beginning of the opera are not necessarily in relationships because they fell head over heels for each other as individuals, but probably because their families said here's who we want you to marry, here's who society says is correct for you to marry, here's how the rest of your life is going to go. So in some ways, when Don Alfonso says to the guys, hey, let's make a bet, will your women be faithful? What he's inadvertently doing is gifting the young lovers the opportunity, even through a crazy disguised atmosphere, to actually woo and fall in love with and get to know someone on their own terms, not by terms that are dictated by society. Oh, and so when the couple yeah. switch, when the couple switch, they get to learn things about themselves. They get to learn things about each other that they may never have had the chance to do if this crazy bet hadn't taken place. Right. And so, yes, by the end of the opera, it is revealed that the boys were in disguise, that they need each other's lovers. And there's a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and a lot of confusion that comes with that. But we've also learned a lot about uh, each of these characters as individuals, what their hearts might want and how they might move forward. So we actually don't end the piece happily ever after. We leave it with um, the women uh, bonding together and, and choosing a future that is their own. And we're leaving the men to be quite disenchanted with the choices that they have made. Um, and the fact that they too are now questioning what it means to be young and in love and to make, you know, independent choices. Yeah. And believe mm. it or not, I think we can successfully do that all within uh, a brilliant, um, sparkling, comedic atmosphere. Yeah. So it feels uh, entertaining, and yet there's wonderful life lessons that are sort of all bundled up at the same time. Yeah, and I, then, I feel and like then Mozart would approve. Yeah, and then Despina runs off with Don Alfonso. Yes. <laughs> well, and so interestingly, so we 
we start all of this in the, uh, you know, Rococo-esque world. But every time, including the disguised looks, every time the young lovers or Despino or Alfonso make choices that break from society, a.k.a. get more modern, right? There's, uh, in America, way way less, uh, you know, society dictated or prearranged marriages today than it would have been um, back in the late 1700s. Um, so every time these characters make a decision, they learn something about themselves, their uh, costumes, their look, their clothing starts to update. Interesting. By the time we get to the end of the piece, the, the fake wedding that should be happening at the end of the evening, they're in modern dress. We're in suits. The women are in pants suits. They're in white wedding looks. It's, wow. um, it's a total journey through time just to allow the audience to see literally the evolution of love play out on stage now, and the choices that we can all make for free will. Early on, you had made mention that you know, uh, the uh, the era, you know, especially like the Rococo, I mean, it's not just the Rococo era at the beginning is not just reflected in like the costume, but also in the theater production as well. And, and like it, I yes. imagine the staging, are you able to uh, alter the staging subtly as we progress throughout uh, the opera and through time, shall we say? Yes, such a great question. And the answer is yes. So two things that play into that. One is the very beginning of the opera. And even when we were staging it, we talked a lot about physicality, you know, how characters would stand, how they interact with each other, how they touch or hold or communicate with each other. Very different in 1790 than how we interact with each other in 2022. Exactly. So you will see the way the characters interact, how they treat each other physically, change, grow, morph over the course of the opera. Then the other thing that happens is the, the environment that the characters find themselves in is literally meant to be looked at as a museum piece. So as an audience member, when you, say, go into an art museum, Oftentimes these days there's a brilliant sort of frame or uh, you know, glass in front of some of the most classic and famous uh, pieces of artwork throughout time so that you're literally looking at art through a lens. Right. We took that same concept and brought it onto the stage here in uh, Arizona, whereas an audience member, when you walk in, you're going to see this big lit frame through which oh. you see what is essentially looks like a diorama uh, or diorama of a um, Rococo-esque Italian villa. Interesting. And the characters in Act 1, before they start to make really forward-thinking changes, they will never break out of that frame. They will stay in the artwork. They will stay in the past. Interesting. But as they start to learn things about themselves, they actually break through that frame. And over the course of Act 2, we get closer and closer to the audience as we make more and more modern choices. Whoa. And so by the end, so by the end, there is only one character who never breaks through the frame. And I'll let the audience guess at who that might be and purchase a <laughs> ticket so they can come find out. But there's only one audience, who, uh, sorry, a uh, character who doesn't break through everybody else has made a forward thinking we've arrived in the future choice interesting i can't wait do they do they still have the lovely faint, <laughs> fainting couch that uh, oh my god they did they did cozy you know, 22 but, years ago i think and there was this there, we have a uh, there is a chaise it's hard to do an opera without a chaise yes <laughs> and it's hard to do an opera uh you know set in time period those would be classic uh drawing room pieces of furniture but I will say we probably use it in ways that are unexpected. I'm, uh, as a director, I'm noted, I see. Uh, I'm noted for like standing on, abusing furniture. I mean, using it in ways that are, are never <laughs> as simple as like properly sitting on. So I think it comes in handy, shall we say? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see this. This was, it sounds this, absolutely. This sounds yeah. like yeah. It's, I, I think it's going to shake. Uh, I, I think it's going to shake up a lot of the uh, the old timers of the opera crowd. They might take a look mm. at this, and they may want to borrow that uh, fainting lounge. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, well, you know what's interesting yes. is, you know, I never, I, I love, I love, love, love it, abstract productions, and I'm always so jealous of uh, you know directors who are like, this is going to be cozy. Uh, 
you know, they're wearing Planet of the Apes costumes oh, and they're God. on the moon and playing tennis, right? <laughs> Whoa, I, I got to think about but that. When, <laughs> but when I sit down to study a piece, no matter what I'm, I'm conceptually looking at, it is always married to the text and the music. So I do think that while, yes, the entire staging of this or concept of this does not just sit happily ever after in a traditional Mozartian world, we are, you know, pushing the envelope and uh, making some updated choices. I really do feel that this will be a, a, a brilliant and viable and fun experience for opera goers, whether you're uh, seeing Cozy for the fifth time or maybe seeing it for the first time. Well, yeah, all I can cool. say is that you had me with uh, Planet of the Apes costumes playing tennis. Yes, you <laughs> yeah. heard it here first, Yeah, you, you had me there, so <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would love to next, talk some more next, with you. Next I, time I'll say to Joe, that'll be my concept. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that, we absolutely have to do that. We're changing gears here at yeah. the last minute. <laughs> yeah, but maybe we can do yeah. that with Sound of Music next year. Um, uh, right. I would love to talk to you some more because I, I I really think there is just a wealth of conversation that's that has not been hasn't happened yet. But unfortunately, we are up against the time. So um, let's just tell people that uh, this production of Cozy Van Tute is going to be performed at Arizona Opera uh, here in Phoenix this coming weekend. And then soon after that, it will be in Tucson. I'm not sure of the dates on that. Yes. Yeah, so eight the through. Weekend. Yep. The following two weekends. Yep. Eight through 10th in Phoenix and 16th or uh, yes, 16th and or 17th. Ah. Uh, 16th and 17th in Tucson. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. And so um, if anybody wants to, you know, and if you're in the area or if you know you're going to be in the area and you sound interested by this because I know that I am, uh, you, you just uh, you know go to azopera.com and, uh, or azopera.org, I should say, and get yourself some tickets. So, but in the meantime... Uh, you are definitely a person that I think people should follow, you know, and it doesn't matter if you just, if you're not interested in opera, I, I think your approach to opera and theater, which I've always maintained uh, are, you know, uh, a much, they live in a much bigger bubble together than most people realize. Uh, I think you have some brilliant ideas uh, as, as to uh, your approach. So, how can people follow you? I mean, is there any social media presence or a website by which people can follow yes. you and, and what you're doing? Absolutely. So please come follow. Please come enjoy the ride. And there's a couple of different ways you can find me. First, uh, I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook page. That's E. Lauren Meeker. And Lauren is spelled funky. It's L-O-R-E-N. It's my grandfather's name. Hmm. But uh, E. Lauren Meeker on Facebook. The same for uh, Instagram. E. Lauren Meeker is my handle. And you can also check out my website, which is www.elaurenmeeker.com. And if you want to see what we're doing at Opera San Antonio, Opera San Antonio is on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and those are all Opera San Antonio. Fantastic. Cool. This has been absolutely delightful. Oh, delightful and enlightening. I am. I mean, I was happy that they're that AZ Opera is doing cozy, but I, now I am really interested in seeing this. So this is going to be great. Super. Thank you so much, Lauren. Well, we for... can't wait to get it on the stage next week, and I can't wait to see you all in the audience. Yes, oh, we'll, we'll be, be there, there Friday and Saturday. Yep. Thank you so much for being Perfect. on the show. Thanks for having me. Hi, this is Joe Spector from Arizona Opera, and you're listening to The Two Gay Geeks. Well, here are a few selected birthdays for April 4th through April the th <laughs> what? <laughs> the 10th. How did the third stay in there? I had I nothing to do with that. I have any idea. You did that. You changed that. Mea yeah, culpa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, April 4th through April 10th, 2022. April 4th, Anthony Perkins, actor of Psycho fame. He was a closeted gay man. Mm, who, yes. Who actually did not find out he was HIV positive until he read it in a magazine article. Oh, and uh, that, sadly, that what a horrible way to find I, out. I know, and then sadly died two years later in 1992 of AIDS. Yeah, I know that he had a, a a relationship. Oh, I can't think of the actor's name from Damn Yankees. Uh, oh, uh, Ty Tab, Tab Hunter. Yeah, Tab Hunter. Yep. Yeah, he had a relationship. Uh, there was in a the 50s. It, it, yeah, yeah. It, they they were a beautiful couple. 
Uh, it was very Hollywood controlled, and they had you know female dates with them all the time. It was exactly. it was awful yep. that they had to do that. And then we have Graham Norton, Irish actor, talk show host, who's out comedian. Gay man. Yes, comedian. Uh, irreverent talk show that pulls no punches. Oh, I, I you, love oh, his talk Lord. show. He is, it's outrageous mm-hmm. sometimes. He auditioned for Sam in Lord of the Rings. Really? Yes. The Peter Jackson version? Yes. I yes. did not know that. And then we have Facebook friend Alan Brockington and Michael Lewis. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. April 5th. Uh, I missed, uh, I forgot to do the research here. Agneta Folkskog. Abba. Abba. Yes. What do you say about uh, Agneta? I know. She's you just, know, wow. She is just incredible. What? Oh, uh, I mean, I love her voice. She was always my favorite. I mean, not not to put anything out, you know, you know, or to dismiss Frida or Anna Frida, but I, I love Agneta and... Wow, her soprano voice is just gorgeous. Yes, and uh, she had a a feature in uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Yes, she did. Yes, we'll not talk about that. No. (laughs) Abba. Mm. Yes, and then we have Betty Davis. Very long career. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, in her later years, I think Betty Davis played Betty Davis. Oh, absolutely. And you she know. knew it. And she knew it. I think she knew it. And I think in some ways she actually played herself as a caricature of herself. Yeah. I kind of get that feeling. I I, th- I thought she was great. You know, I and, loved her in Death on the Nile. Oh, she was great. And, and in so many other things. I remember what was the last thing that she did where she was... The mother oh my beehive goodness. lady. I don't some remember. TV made for TV movie. I don't remember oh, she what was that was. Creepy, creepy, creepy. She was very good at creepy. Yep. And uh, so she was just, uh, she was a, a wonder in herself. Oh, yes. April 6th, James Watson, molecular biologist and geneticist. He was, he was the co discoverer of the double helix model of the DNA molecule oh. in the 1950s. Uh, won a Nobel. Uh, prize for that and john ratzenberger actor of cheers uh cliff the Mm -hmm. (laughs) know-it-all and pixar's good luck charm he was i know uh, the last several pixar films he has not been a part of i know he wasn't in uh luca no he wasn't in in canto no and there's another one um oh my goodness uh oh i can't remember the name about the the black jazz singer or uh, jazz player yeah, I thought he was in that. No, he wasn't in that one either. Uh, anyway, he said that P.T. Flea is his favorite character from Bugs Life. <laughs> it's the most outrageous of them all. It is. It really is. Because he had a, a, actually a, a bigger part than most <laughs> in most Well, that of them. one and also in uh, Cars as, yeah. as Mac. I thought he was great as that. Yeah. Well, he he wasn't Mac. Uh, yes, he was Mac. He was Mac. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, it was the, I'm thinking of. You're thinking of Peterbilt. Yes, Exactly. April 7th, Ravi Shankar, a sitarist. He was a sitar virtuoso. Yes. And brought the sound of Indian classical music to the world starting in the 50s. And gained tremendous popularity through his association with the violinist Yehudi Menuhin and guitarist George Harrison. Well, and it it went beyond that. I mean, he kind of got into the pop culture because I know that there was an opportunity for, um, yes, guitarist Trevor Rabin to actually go on tour with him, you know, open for, for Ravi uh, on Ravi's tour. But uh, for whatever reason, Trevor, he couldn't do it and he desperately wanted to. So that just kind of shows the reach that Ravi Shankar had as a musician. Yep. And then we have David Frost, a talk show host um, extraordinaire. You might, oh, yeah. You might say his program was one of the very early, quote, unquote, news and informational programs where kind of like the Barbara Walters in interviews, but he was early on. He was, he was very early and, on. And I, I think, I mean, there was a little bit of a, a, a lightheartedness to it, but I think it's when he did his interviews with Nixon. Well, that's when, when it really changed. Uh, a lot of, uh, of the world leaders that he would ask probing questions of his guests. Right. You know, so he was uh, quite the interviewer. Uh, there was just several people in that 60s and 70s era that uh, kind of brought that forward. And, and now we see a lot of it, oh, you know, yeah. just as a matter of course. 
And then we have a friend of ours, Tiffany Rodriguez, uh, Miguel's wife. Yes. Uh, and then Craig Baumler here in Phoenix. He's a composer. And my brother's, I believe he was my brother's composition teacher yeah. in San Jose State University. Yep. April 8th, Patricia Arquette, actress. She's been around for quite a, a while, while. Uh, but only recently came to to our my attention in CSI Cyber. I right. think you may have uh, seen I'd her. I'd seen her some... around uh, you know, before that, but right. that's where I think she really kind of broke out. Yeah, and it was uh, a very different character than what she's playing now <gasps> in Severance. Yes, I as Mrs. Selvig. I am in awe at the depth of her acting ability in she's Severance. She's really good. I mean, good. it's just... Well, a- actually, all of them. Yeah. This... This playing this these two very different people. Mm-hmm. Most of the actors is just in. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, and based on this last episode that we saw, wow, her oh character, my. her character has taken a whole new turn, and I can't wait to see where this where she is going. Yeah, and she was actually married to Nick Cage at one point. Oh, I didn't know that. And when uh, when they first met, she felt that he was coming on a little too strong. And gave him an impossible list of things, uh, of accomplishments that he must meet to go out with her. He probably did it, too. And several months later, he comes she was back surprised to find out that he had been working through the list. <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> Julian Lennon. Oh, my goodness. Musician, son of John Lennon. Uh, when he decided to embark on a musical career, the demo tapes that they sent in did not have his name on them. Indeed. It wasn't, oh, he wanted to yeah. go. Bl- he he probably did not want to ride on his daddy's coattails. Nope. It wasn't until after Charisma Records signed them that uh, they knew that the lead singer was Julian. I yeah, I, I was pleased to find out that Julian and his half brother Sean Lennon are very very close. Yeah. In fact, Julian taught Sean how to play the guitar. Julian doesn't do music anywhere. He um he's now Doing he's photography. Photography. Photography is his big thing now, and he's yep. very happy doing that. Yep. And then a friend of ours or mine, Bruce Pulver, April 9th, Sorka Cusack. Actress. I know who she is. Irish actress who has been around British television for quite some mm-hmm. time and came to our attention, thanks to Lynn and John, as Mrs. McCarthy. Yes. In Father Brown. Oh She's my a God. delight. I love Mrs. McCarthy. <laughs> well, I love all the characters well, in Father true. Brown. It's a wonderful show. The Father Brown Mysteries. And then we have Mary Jackson, mathematician who is a woman of color. She was one of the quote-unquote computers who joined NASA in 1958 Hmm. that sent the astronauts to outer space and the moon. Yes. Spent 34 years in government service, and the NASA headquarters in D.C., is named the Mary Jackson NASA headquarters now. I, I like how the the TV series Timeless did a very good episode on her and her contribution. I, I thought that was wonderful. Yep. And then we have a friend of ours, Tracy Kloss, who lives out in Los Angeles. April 10th, Joe Green. Mm. Also known as Giuseppe, Giuseppe Verdi, Verdi. <laughs> composer of Verismo Opera, very popular operas in the opera canon, Tosca, Traviata. Tosca? I, uh, not Tosca. Why did, why did Traviata. I Traviata. Traviata. I, I was r- trying to write that, and it, I was trying to write autocorrect? something else. <laughs> yes. Damn autocorrect. <laughs> and wrote several operas of about the Spanish nobility, Don Carlo. Yes, and, Don Carlo. Uh, La um, Forza del Bart- Destino. Botello. Simone Bocanegra. Yeah. Um, all of those. And it was very interesting operas. He had a number of signature chord progressions and movements that mm-hmm. just scream Verdi. Oh, and, yes. And, and several of his... The high soprano firework, he, even though it was Verismo, it, he had a certain There was a certain signature. bel canto, yeah. uh, a very, well, I've, I've also heard some of his earlier works being called late bel canto opera. Yep. And then we have Max von Sydow, actor Flash. Ah, uh, yes. Ming the Munificent. Uh, or Ming the, the Merciless. What? Merciless. The Munificent. <laughs> <laughs> you made that up, didn't you? I did. Uh, okay. <laughs> and so many other movies, both here and abroad. Yeah. 13 Ingmar Bergman films. 
I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but I think he, he came to America's attention probably as Father Marin in The Exorcist. Yeah. And uh, died in 2020 at the age of 90. It's amazing. Oh, I, I think he's he's a fantastic actor. And that's it for the birthdays this time. Technorama, the podcast for geeks, because geeks are better than cool. You don't hear someone say, get away from me, you cool person. Who's going to have their 65-inch home theater system installed by the cool squad? Not Not me, me, that's that's for sure. sure. How much cool cred do you have? Not enough to care about. Think you'll find any canned unicorn meat at thinkcool.com? It's just a part domain name. They don't even have roadkill in a paper cup. That's why you need to start listening to Technorama, because that's what geeks do. Go to chuckchat.com and listen to Technorama before you turn cool. Go give a listen to our friends Chuck and Craig over at Technorama Podcast. I'm Daniel Radcliffe, and I believe that reaching out for help is the bravest thing a person can do. If you are struggling and need support, call the Trevor Lifeline at 1-866-488-7386. It's free and confidential, and trained counsellors are there to listen 24-7 without judgment. To learn more about the Trevor Project's life-saving work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or questioning young people, go to thetrevorproject.org. We want to give a shout out, as always, to the Joshua Tree Feeding Program, a 501c3 nonprofit food pantry for the HIV and AIDS community in Maricopa and Pinal counties. They could certainly use your help during this time. They are an all profit organization, so uh, any help that you can give them through donations or through, you know, monetary donations, you can do that by going to jtfp.org. And it's time for our feedback. These are comments that we received in response to articles and episodes that we ran on our website at teachgeeks.com. And the links for each of these items will be in the show notes for this episode, article number 372 at teachgeeks.com. Starting with regarding TG Geeks episode number 365, where we interviewed Tommy Cannon. We got a comment from, again, from the Lestrange Lair on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I'm beginning to, I want to know who this person I is know now. Who this is I now. really want to know. <laughs> this person wrote Horror and Fantasy and Chupacabras. Those are a few of our favorite things. Now, that's going to be a song in my head all day. Horror Great episode. Fantasy. You lot seem a ton of, f- I like that. You lot seem a ton of fun, like a barrel of Chupacabras, signed Bella L. A barrel of chupacabras. A barrel of chupacabras, yes. Go. So, yeah, I, re- I really want to know who that person is. Moving on regarding Hamish Downey's first Friday playlist for March 2022. And these are people that all responded back to Hamish, but because it was our article, yeah. Anyway, first there was a comment from Felicity Tillack, who says, thanks for including me. Jamie Kessler says, nice. Sheridan Jobbins says, now this one, it, it's more of a, a written comment, so it's you have to bear with me, says, I just say I'm a fox. Now, fox is spelled fo-x. F-A-U-X. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cute. Huh. Huh. And then huh. we uh, close that off with a comment from Elizabeth Gray saying, thanks, Hamish. Moving on, we got a comment. Uh, this is in response to Teach Geeks episode number 368. We got a comment on our YouTube channel from Anime Who Review Channel says, Hello there, guys, Ben and Keith. Well, I know well, who. Hello, that's, Darren. Uh, hello, Darren. Yes. <laughs> and that, that's one of my best friends in, in England, yes. uh, the Darren Anderson. Uh, then or got, Daz. Or Daz, as he likes yes. to say. Then we got a comment from Arkel. Yeah, we all know Arkel. He says, First thing that really jumped. Oh, because we also talked about Star Trek Picard. Yes. And he said, first thing that really jumped out at me about the new Stargazer was how it looked a fair amount like the Burren class from Star Trek Online. That was neat because one of my characters in the game has a Burren class, the USS Nial, as his final ship. I've even done a few videos with her, the ship, the captain is male. 
She's as pretty as the character I named her after. Moving on, got a comment from Brian Kirst. I believe it was his birthday because he responds with, yes. thank you. And then we got a follow-up comment from Hamish Downey who says, I think it's time Brian Kirst was on the podcast. Yes, we should be. On, he should be on the podcast. Email me. Yeah. <laughs> and that is our feedback. <laughs> you can leave a comment on any place that you can find us, like Facebook or TGGeeks.com or our YouTube episodes or Twitter Face, uh, Instagram. Did I say Facebook? We're not on TikTok. No, we don't, not yet. We don't move that way. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Yep. Instagram. And if, wait, a website. And our website. And if you want to leave us a voicemail, By we will means, play it on please. air. You can call 469-TG-Geeks. That is 469-844-3357. And as always, please, please play, play nice. nice. For more than two decades, Judy and Dennis Shepard have honored their son, Matt, by working to erase hate around the world. The Matthew Shepard Foundation honors his legacy by inspiring the good work of activists, teachers, artists, and legislators, and everyday LGBTQ plus folks and their allies. Join us today in helping to erase hate. Visit MatthewShepard.org. Thank you to Comcast NBC Universal for that promo. We run these because we want to bring awareness of the issues that the LGBTQ community faces and has needs to start facing again. Yes, we because do. Because of the insanity. And I'm going to get off that soapbox real quick. And we're huge supporters of independent. Well, segue into the yeah huge support that of was smooth, creators, yeah or not. <laughs> uh, independent creators, whether it's filmmakers, comic book artists, writers, or others, please, if you see them at cons, you see them online, talk th- to them, talk to other people about them, talk to you know everybody you can about their stuff if you like it, and buy their stuff. It's always nice to mm-hmm. buy their stuff. Please support independent creators. If you are trans or are questioning your gender identity, and if you are in crisis or are feeling isolated and need someone to talk to, or you know of someone in a similar situation, there is a special hotline just for you. The hotline is provided by translifeline.org and staffed by trained counselors who are transgender themselves. The hotline in the U.S. is 877-565-8860. In Canada, it is 877-330-6366. Or you can go to translifeline.org to learn about the important work they are doing. Please reach out for help. You are not alone. And it's time for our weekly review. These are items that we ran on our website at tggeeks.com this past week, and the links for each of these will be in the show notes for this episode, article number 372 at tggeeks.com, starting with Sunday, March 27th, Nerdy Chupacabras number 93. Approaching on, 100. Approaching 100. On Monday the 28th, TG Geeks episode number 371. And earlier you heard Keith talk about uh, independent creators. Well, this is a big one. On Tuesday the 29th, Carmen, the graphic novel Kickstarter now available. It's fully funded. But you can, you can still, still contribute. get involved. Yes. Still get involved. On Wednesday the 30th, Andrea's Angle, Mothering Sunday, impeccable acting, disjointed story. On Thursday the 31st, Andrea's Angle, You Won't Be Alone, Unique and Evocative Twist on Witches. On Friday, April 1st, Hamish Downey's First Friday Playlist, April 2022. And we close off the week on the 2nd, The Rise of Gru, another Minions movie, in theaters July 1st. If you can't get enough Minions, here's another one. (laughs) 
We have some shout-outs that we need to make. First to Brian Weber. You heard him earlier in the feedback. He is Arkel. He is on Twitter as uh, Geek of All Trades, and Geek is spelled the letter G, the number three, the number three K of all trades. He's also referred to as Brian the Ampersand List YouTuber, and his Arkel Times Post Dispatch News can be found on Twitter. All you have to do is search for Brian the Ampersand List YouTuber or Geek of All Trades, and <laughs> there you go. And while you're looking for all things Arkel, go to his YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Arkel Studios. He has a number of projects there. His Shameless Cash Grab series, which is in Season 7. His Rants vs. Zombies series. It is officially ended, but past episodes are still available. He also has Arkel Tier Ranks, as well as game videos of Trick and Treat, as well as Star Trek Online. We must also give some shout-outs to a couple of Facebook groups for allowing us to post our episodes and relevant articles on their pages. First to Gay Geeks After Hours. Big thanks to their moderators for saying that we could share away our content there. And their URL is facebook.com slash groups slash Gay Geeks After Hours, and that is one word. And then to The Gay Geek for the same. And their web address is Facebook.com slash group slash the gay geek. And as always, we give special thanks to their moderator, Jeremiah Reeves. Thank you, Jeremiah. Other places we can be found are Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Amazon Podcasts, as well as where other fine podcasts can be found. Also, check us out on Sci Fi Radio at 3 a.m., 3 p.m. Pacific Time on Tuesdays for a replay of the show and listen to their other content. They are a 20 24-hour geeky internet radio station. Please rate us and review us on iTunes, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, Arizona Opera, in Phoenix, Cozy Fantuti, April 8th through 10th, Tucson, April 16th and 17th. Tickets are still available at azopera.org. And that should do it for this episode of TG Geeks Webcast. Be sure to check out the article for this webcast episode. We'll have several links on the page of things we talked about. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website, tggeeks.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. From TG Squared Studios, I am Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. Please be kind to yourself and those around you. Stay safe, wear a mask, get vaccinated. Peace. Cheers. Cheers.